Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Closing the Skills Gap, How to Cultivate a New Generation of Experts. This webinar is co-hosted by ISA and Maverick Technologies. I'm Michaela Cooper with ISA and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items so you can know how to participate in today's webinar. Uh, next slide, please. First, in regards to the question and answer session, uh, we do have a Q&A session at the end. And to submit your questions, just type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please don't use the chat toolbox for the Q&A session. Uh, if you have miscellaneous questions for me, just submit those into the chat box, but not the Q&A box. Now, unfortunately, with this many pre-registrants, we cannot open up the phone lines for questions. So if we do not get a chance to respond to your question, or if you'd like to discuss a topic in more detail with one of the presenters, uh, their contact information will be given at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who just joined, please make sure you're on mute. If you'd like to see the phone and audio broadcast instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email I sent to you today. Uh, there's also some information on the events info tab that's in your WebEx screen. You can find some of those connection instructions there as well. Uh, additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey should pop up in your browser. Please just take a few minutes to fill out this survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar so we can know how to better, better um, our webinars uh, to suit what you're wanting in these webinars. Okay, I think that takes care of our housekeeping matters. So let's go ahead and introduce our presenters. I'm going to hit the next slide. Brom has 13 years of industrial automation experience. He is currently the Strategic Manufacturing Solutions Manager at Maverick Technologies, overseeing the sustaining services practice. Brom has been in this position for four years and responsible for the daily operations of the Global Operations Center, Plant Floor 24. He is responsible for staffing, training, and developing Plant 424 resources. The center provides a wide range of on-demand industrial control system and manufacturing IT support services on a 24-7, 365 basis. Rom has a master's in electrical engineering from the Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and works in Maverick's Columbia, Illinois office. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, our second presenter, Rachel. She has more than 22 years of industrial automation experience and has been in her current position for two years. She has provided the Pulse business uh, for the past 22 years with knowledge and experience in project management, process analyst, and process optimization. Uh, develops process relational databases for instrument management systems, Honeywell distributed control logic programming, and process modeling. Rachel has provided leadership in the development of best practices for paper mill operations while utilizing the management of change process and procedures. Now, I'd like to pass it off to Ron to go over the agenda and kick off this webinar. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking your time to attend this webinar. Uh, let me lay out the agenda for the, for the next hour and then uh, start getting into the details. I would like to start off by uh, telling everybody, in my opinion, how we got to where we got in terms of uh, lack of skilled uh, workers, in terms of providing day-to-day -day operation support for our global operations and within Maverick and, and the industry. And what was our game plan to, to, to overcome those hurdles and what approaches we took and the results. And I'll show you a few examples of workflow and our, and our knowledge capture, knowledge transition, knowledge retention, knowledge delivery capabilities. And then Rachel will come in and talk from her side as, as an end user at a paper mill on her experience in terms of how the process control infrastructure is changing in addition to the aging workforce and how she is going about doing this, doing, how, how she's going about coming up to, with a solution to overcome these uh, hurdles and, and uh, the skill gap examples that she's used. And we'll conclude with a Q&A session at the end. So, to, in my opinion, uh, having done this not, not as long as a lot of other people, how did we get here? When six, seven, eight years ago, when the economy started slowing down, a lot of organizations, including us, we realized uh, 
the key skills were concentrated with a limited group of employees. These were the subject matter experts, your technical leads on your project, uh, the people that have been doing it for a long time. They knew how to accomplish certain things. And as a project manager, I was going to them to get my tasks done in a seamless manner because they, they were the experts. They knew what they were doing and oh, blah, 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 everything was good. What we then realized is we started asking us the question, if the most knowledgeable people in the team were also the most experienced, were also the ones that were closer to retirement, what would happen when they, when they would retire? Were we ready? We looked at a couple of options. The offshoring model was one of them. And any time you look at an offshoring model, you got to realize there is a language gap, a cultural gap, uh, sometimes quality issues coming back and forth. There are a lot of companies that are successful doing it, and, uh, and there, are, there are hurdles, and there is some headache in the process. And what we realized is we, are, we didn't want to go down that route. Um, and, and the biggest concern was still there, what would happen when, when the aging workforce retired? And we did some studies, and we talked to a few people, and, and it, it, it turns out uh, from a study that Deloitte did, for every dollar spent in manufacturing uh, within the United States, it returns a dollar thirty-seven return on investment. So it's a 37% return on, on, on every dollar you spend. And in terms of creating jobs, manufacturing industries create, uh, for every 100 new manufacturing jobs, it creates an additional 250 jobs in other sectors and you add those two up, it creates jobs, it gives you a good return on investment, and nearly 3.5 manufacturing engineering jobs need to be filled in the next 10 years, and a lot of those jobs won't have experienced people available to, to fill in those holes. So there's a business proposition, there's a need, and there is a community responsibility to partner with schools and train people and so on and so forth. So that led to the next Next idea of how do we build bench strength? You could go one of two routes. You could hire the best engineers you can find from a local technical school or from an engineering college. Train them to understand your culture, your needs, your manufacturing needs versus your software needs, so on and so forth. Or you could go out and hire the most experienced people that you can find. What we did was we uh, went the first approach where we partnered with the local community school versus a, and a tech school, and we have five or six partnerships across the country. We hire on an average about 30 engineers a year, and, and we train them. And when, you, when it comes to training, you've got to prioritize your training based on your short-term needs, long-term needs, fits within an office, so on and so forth. So that's, that's in summary how we, how we started, what we saw, and what, what, what we ended up with. And how did we plan for this? Senior researchers have been doing this for a while, like I said, and more often than not, uh, if somebody has been doing and or used to a certain way of doing a certain task or used to a certain flexibility in their role, uh, change for a senior resource is the most uh, difficult thing is what we realize. So the first part is having a buy-in from all your experts, your mentors, and your trainees, and, and this is an organizational change. Uh, once we had the buy-in from the resources from the organization and we had a plan in place, we came up with a way to communicate. Sometimes over-communication and things like these are critical. Uh, we are not asking, the key here is to tell a senior resource, we are not asking you to train your replacement so you're out of a job. We are, we, you are doing this so you can do bigger, better things and have more flexibility. And when you train people to do the work that the way you would like done, just because you've done it for 35 years, uh, a new person coming in might challenge you, might have a better way of telling uh, you how to do certain things. It opens up new ways and collaboration and, and invents a greater uh, way of doing doing things. So you, you identify the people, you communicate, and you define the process. The key here is do not add bureaucracy uh, in terms of uh, having people fill in the paperwork. Uh, you, you want to keep it as simple as, as possible. At the same time, uh, let, let the people in your team wow you. And the only way you do that is every company has, this, has access to the same set of graduates graduating this year. What differentiates you from somebody coming in and wanting to work for you is what you can offer them in terms of challenges, 
job satisfaction, uh, and so on and so forth. And we paired an, a new hire coming in. We, we let's, for the purpose of this webinar, let's call the person a trainee with a mentor slash expert slash a senior engineer, and there was a relationship built between those two. And when, when, when you pair two people and say, I'm going to train you to do some things, and in return, you are going to create these training documents that I can reuse for the future for others, it builds that camaraderie between them. And the way you do that, do that is critical. If you can't just throw it on the other side of the wall and, and hope and pray it's going to work out. You need to have rigor. You need to monitor and control your process. And by empowering employees and investing in new hires, we have, we have, we have figured out that, that this is a very successful model to, to be in. And what, what did we, our approach was to leverage our bench strength. We have about 500 employees spread over 20 different offices with, with diverse skill sets. So we leveraged that. We went with the build model where we were going to develop our own training modules for hires. Before you roll something out for the entire organization, we realized we needed to pilot test it. You could go one of two ways. You could either come up with a procedure and pilot, pilot it with existing employees, or you could pilot it with the first set of new hires that you want to put them through the system. And then where do you get your talent? We partner with local technical school and an engineering uh, college here locally uh, out of the St. Louis metro area to find talent. In addition to that, as the program has grown, we have partnered with, with, with a handful of other schools to find the right talent for us. And one size doesn't fit all. We realized that after the first uh, year or so. Uh, it, it has to be a customized training. People coming in to a training program have, have different sets of skills, have different expectations, are at different levels in terms of experience within a product. Um, so you've got to customize it to the needs of a trainee and the mentor. And you have to monitor and control your process. Uh, you just, like I said, you can just throw it on the other side of the wall and hope and pray it's going to work out. And what we found over time, uh, that it increased efficiency and quality of product that we deliver. It decreased cost. Uh, it, it reduced rework. It improved reuse if you have multiple trainees going through the same program and one set of trainees have created enough training modules for you. Uh, you you're not redoing the training modules for every new hire coming into your system. It, it, it made the process that you are, your, your trainee coming out of the program is going to work on a project, the quality of work coming from this person was going to be more reliable. It, the, the amount of time it took to give a deliver to deliver a product was more predictable, so it improved our estimation on projects, and it gave us a flexibility where we are going to have more employees that can do more things, and that helps with your employee growth career path program, and it all led to an employee uh, higher employee retention rate. Our, ours was historically high, and this took it to the next level. And you standardize solutions for people coming in. So three people working on a certain problem trained by a senior engineer are going to do it the same way, not, not you don't put, you, you put three engineers in a room and give them a solution. You're going to get five different ways of doing this. Uh, but that we, by standardizing the solution, we eliminated that. And what else did it help? It reduced the total cost of labor because we could improve our staffing. We were more predictable. It reduced the total project cost. It reduced training time, integration time, and year over year, working on a programmatic approach, it reduced the total cost of uh, doing work and, and, efficient, and made it more efficient. On the next slide, I'm going to, on this slide, I'm going to talk about the workflow, uh, how, how, we, how we ended up doing everything we, I told you we, we accomplished. To start off, data is the key. You don't know what you don't know. So what we had is we had multiple resources. When I said this pilot program, pick a platform, pick a product, pick an application, however you want to do it, you need to have good data. Uh, we start off with each resource working on a team, be it the mentor or the trainee or, or existing resources, come up with a list of questions. They contribute to a questionnaire. It, it pretty much says, what do I know? What do I don't know based on what I see others around me do or the other projects that, that we work on as a company? Where would I like to be, as, uh, my career path to be, and to get 
from point A to point B, what are the skills I am missing? So if you have a team of 10 people and everybody fills this questionnaire of these are the 10, 15 tasks I know, these are the 10, 20, 30 things I do on a regular basis, these are the things I don't know, these are the things I want to know, these are the things I would want to be an expert in. So if 10 people give you a questionnaire like that, you have your what, 100 pages of documents. So then you assign an expert for different knowledge categories and say, within this knowledge category, you're going to consolidate the questions, delete repetitive questions from these 10 different questionnaires and come up with one consolidated skill gap assessment questionnaire. So once you have identified four or five different knowledge categories or knowledge silos as you might call, um, you, have, you have skills assessment complete for each of those knowledge categories, then you go back to the entire team of your 10 people in this example and say, on this product, on this platform, on this revision, this is the four-page document of different questions. Why don't you answer these questions in terms of do I, what, what is my skill level? Am I, do I consider myself an expert? Do I consider myself an intermediate person? Do I consider myself a beginner? Or I have no idea what this product is about. So once everybody has answered those questions, you look at your entire team and it, as a manager or, or as a supervisor, or as a trainee or a lead, it gives you an idea of where your team's strengths and weaknesses are. So all you've just done so far is understand your team's skills skill gaps, and that will help you prioritize based on what you don't know, which is your workload. If you know you need a person with this platform working on your team six months from now, and you look at your skill gap metrics or your questionnaire, you know you don't have that skill, guess what, you have six months to act on. And you can, like I said, you can pilot that on your existing team before you roll it out to your new hires. And once, you're, once your experts are identified for, with each knowledge area, so let's pick a platform and a, and, a, and a handful of 10, 20 different tasks for that subcategory in that platform. The expert would then partner with a trainee and say, this is what you would do to do these tasks in this category or in this platform. And in return, what the expert gets from the trainee is training documents in terms of a cheat sheet, a questionnaire, a training video. So if I'm, supposed, if I'm considered to be an expert in certain platforms and I have four people that don't know certain things in that platform and I train those four people and in return I get training documents that I can reuse, if I can get cheat sheets that I can reuse, guess what, two months from now when I have to train the next set of four people, I'm not reinventing the wheel. And I take the training document developed by trainees, evaluate it, peer review it, make sure it is, it's, it's good enough to be delivered to the next group and then deliver it to the next group, and, and, and it's an iterative process. The goal here is over time, you are going to find uh, these trainings evolve, they get fine-tuned, and if you do this for two, three, four years, your training is at a point where it's sitting on the shelf, you have new hires coming in, new people coming into your project team, you have a guideline, you assign those courses to them, you have a one-to-one -one relationship, you, you start reviewing their progress over time. And the same thing, you bring in new people, put them into the same process. It's, it's, it's an assembly line process. You have the whole process defined. It goes back to three things, people, process, rigor. You have you, everybody you hire, you has everybody, every company has access to the same set of people. You hire the best talent you can find. You have the best process defined. That's where I say you eliminate bureaucracy and you monitor and control your process to a, to a point where Every, every individual coming out of your training program is going to have the same level of skill level and you standardize solutions in terms of what people accomplish. So to summarize in a picture format, you analyze your skills, you understand where your skills are concentrated, you understand your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, the example Rachel is going to show in the next few minutes uh, is, is going to show what she's done in terms of products and aging workforce as well. Two people independently worked on it, Rachel and I, and we didn't know, we didn't talk about it until we had our final results. And when we talked, we didn't know the other person was working on it, and it was, it was almost to the same conclusion. Once you've identified your strengths, weaknesses in your assets, then you have a plan for each employee. This is where I say once, I said earlier, one size doesn't fit all. A plan for one individual might not work for another. That's where you need to have a one-to-one -one relationship between a mentor and a trainee. In some cases, it's a one-to-many or a many-to-one. Uh, I'll show you a slide. Uh, 
that will talk about that a little bit. And goes back to the monitor and control and the mentoring process. Just because somebody has gone through the system doesn't mean they are vetted. You need to have a, a certification, an evaluation process to say, have you seen these things in this scenario? What would you do? In this scenario, how would you change the PV of a control valve in this software system? For this client working on this application, what are the four or five things you do? That's the final skill evaluation part is, part of it is, when I, when I talked on an earlier slide, it improves quality, is because people coming in and out of the system know the right way to do various tasks working on a project. And part of that goal, to accomplish that goal, you have the trainees perform real-world tasks as they are going through the training process. So the on-the-job on training, performing multiple tasks, frequently cross-checking, documenting uh, peer reviews, uh, doing multiple quality checks will improve quality. At the end result, the client is going to get a better product if you're a service provider. And a skill gap analysis, what we, what we use is if you, look at, if you look at this picture here, it lists uh, different employees and different, uh, different categories as, as various columns. Uh, if, you, if you look at the second row, uh, the, the name that's in red, uh, this person is a thought leader across multiple platforms. So if you're sitting here as a supervisor and looking at it, your first thought is, man, what, does this, what happens when this person retires? I've lost my thought leader in five different platforms. And the same thing if you look at the third row from the bottom, I have a new hire coming in, learning multiple platforms, and multiple soft skills, so on and so forth. So if you are a project manager evaluating uh, various components within a project and you know this person is working on your job, that's a risk. And, and when I say it's a risk, you have to mitigate that risk. You have to manage it in a way that the expert or people working with this person will perform peer reviews and quality reviews of, the, of this person's work. Uh, so when, so we, have, we have so far talked about how we get people in, how we train them, what are the different knowledge silos, and then the next slide I'm going to talk about is a, is a training program. If you have a training program where you have multiple people working on multiple platforms, you have to define where they start and where they end. This is where I say one size doesn't fit all. The training program might be one, but if somebody knows a certain line item within their training program, they can test out of it. And where this validates is if you have a new hire coming in and if this new hire knows a certain platform, now if you have a fresh pair of eyes looking at your already completed training documents, and this person should be able to go through the, your training a lot faster. And two, it helps you evaluate the new person coming in and somebody says they know, engineers are not good at evaluating their skills. Either they, they, they overestimate their skills or they way underestimate. In my opinion, uh, from my experience, I've seen people, engineers underestimate uh, where, what they think they know versus what they actually know. So putting even a new hire or an experienced hire through, a, through an existing training program does two things, gives you a real baseline on where this person's skill level is. And you can do that for not just uh, product platform applications, we can do that for different soft skills as well. And we try to keep most of our training videos within, within two, three minute to five minute pieces and a training module to be no more than an hour. And this is again an example on how we, how we evaluate our team. And when I say, uh, when I say there's a relationship between a mentor and a trainee, uh, this is what I want you guys to think of. Uh, a mentor shares a unique relationship with a trainee, and a trainee shares a unique relationship with a mentor. Different trainees have different needs. Different uh, trainees will give you different deliverables. But if you're a mentor slash an expert for that area, you need to be peer reviewing their work. You need to be sitting down with them. That's where I think at Maverick we did, we did we were uniquely qualified. We have we took our bench strength available to our advantage to leverage all our experienced people that were experts in different categories to bring in new people. That's where size and, and the quality of people we had helped us. And the other place this helps if you're a multi-site, multi-geographic uh, location, multi-product, multi-platform company, uh, historically what I've seen is most of your resources of a certain platform or application are concentrated in one geographic location. So if you're having ideas for growing your company or you're, you're growing faster than you can find talent, 
you can cross train an office in the west coast by augmenting them with a team from the midwest or or vice versa so over time you can diversify your portfolio that you have multiple people within an office that can know multiple platforms so your risks are, are is not concentrated in one area Having said that, I was going to uh, show a few, a couple of examples on on, on what my what what a sample uh, training document would look like or a training video would look like. This is an operator training guide on on a new person coming in. How would you go through uh, an, an HMI application, uh, talking to them about the navigation of a system? So, I'm, I'm, this is self-paced training, and this talks about where your different uh, navigation screens are. Uh, you guide through a list of all your screens, and this talks about for a new person coming in that might not know how a valve is represented in this HMI, and this is where you show where a valve is, and, and you point out and show where the uh, different things next to a valve mean. That means it's a fail open valve. That means it's a fail close valve. And uh, how do you open, I'm going to fast forward this video, how do you open a faceplate? How do you put a valve in manual versus if it is in program mode, how do you open and close a valve, and then how do you go and operate the alarm. So so I hope you guys get an idea of, of once a, a supervisor at the shift brings a new operator in and trains them through this system on how to, how to open and close valves and how to start and stop pumps, how to look for alarms, how to look for interlocks, how to go through sequencing, so on and so forth. The idea here is as a supervisor, I'm not spending uh, two hours for every new hire coming in, going, showing them the system. I've created it, I've shown the first guy. He creates a training module. I use the training module. Over time, I fine tune it, use it for the second guy, the third person, the fourth person coming in through the system. The other example I, I would like to use is uh, for people that have worked on, on, on a Rockwell system, uh, scheduling control net. Uh, again, this is again a self paced training. You follow the steps of uh, scheduling the network. You go create a new file, you go online, you browse for the uh, PLC that you want to go to, get the get the control net part going, and then it goes and populates and fills up your tree. Then you go to the network and you, you have to enable edits, then you use your online edits to upload file, then you optimize packets, you tell where you want to store the file, so on and so forth. So if I've never done control net, or at two in the morning I want to schedule a control net network, and I don't know all these little steps that have to be that have to be done. I can go back to my skill brief, see where my uh, training was, and all the skill briefs that I've completed. Watch this two-minute video that's part of Control Net and Ethernet network architecture training, and click the box that says how do I schedule Control Net. And the next thing you know is I remember things that either I went through training or I created, and I've accomplished what I uh, am supposed to accomplish. So having said that, that's the last slide I had. I've shown you some sample documents. I'll, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel for her. Uh... Great. Um, closing the skill gap, I'll continue. You know, in the paper industry, pulp and paper industry, we are experiencing um, a lot of changes. Uh, we have an aging workforce, and then all of our technology has been changing. That platform has been changing. Um, so with the changes in the infrastructure, I'm focused on the process control side. So we've experienced a lot of obsolescence equipment and software that we're having to update. We have to replace with new technology. Um, the process control infrastructure and network itself continues to grow and expand. and so we're faced with, you know, multiple control systems. We have uh, the local control network as well as the IT-based network that's on a Windows environment, and uh, we're operating on these multiple platforms. And the process control network traffic itself continues to, to increase. We have pretty much over 300 devices that are on our controls network at this time, and it's growing um, each year. Can you progress to the next slide for me? So with this change that's happening, what, what are we doing and how can we accommodate this change? And the best thing that we've come up with is to, we got to meet the challenge um, in the business. 
and make the adjustments as necessary. And one of those things that require, is required is that we're going to have to get, gain and attain new skill sets as well as make staffing changes to effectively manage the system and the technology growth that we're experiencing here. We've learned, um, have to learn and acquire new skills as well as develop new standards and procedures that will help us to identify and organize these new, new uh, standards and procedures for these new pieces of equipment and technology. Developing new roles and restructuring existing roles is something else that we focused at here at, uh, at Warehouser um, for the controls, controls team and the ENI staff and community. And then we had to decide, you know, how we're going to balance these critical skills across the meal and across the team. So we're identifying uh, the critical skills and we're providing training. And we're providing training to our ENI community as well to help um, really, I guess, make, diversify um, our, all of our technical support. And for the controls technology, we, we just did an assessment on all of the technology within the meal. And there's well over 10 major OEM platforms that are in, has installed base within our, within our meal. And so we're doing, constantly doing migrations with these OEM platforms, and we're doing upgrades as well. So with that, we thought, you know, we have all of these changes and all of these platforms how are we going to best meet the needs for the skills as well as um, being able to maintain and manage what we have? After the assessment of all of the technology that we had, we then looked at the skill sets that we had here in the meal. And preparing for the, the, the changes in retirement, you know, we started to do some succession planning. And with that, I wanted to really balance those critical skills that we saw for the technology that we had in that list. How could we get the, the critical skills meal-wide across the team as well as in the, in the ENI community? That was one of the major goals. And it will not only help strengthen our team, but it was going to strengthen the meal and put us at a better position so that uh, if something happens to a piece of equipment or uh, application, we're not depending on just one individual with those skills. In this diagram, you kind of see a layout of how our team is actually structured. We have the operating, operating units with the fiber line, the product unit, and utilities. We have ENI community that's associated with all of those operations, and then we have some meal-wide skills. And within each operation, we have process control engineers and process control technicians. Where I kind of wanted to, uh, reason why I showed you this is I wanted to hone in on the, the number of years that several of these individuals that have the skills set there have uh, services, uh, service years of up to 35 years plus. And so we're now developing or actually looking and identifying successors for each of these individuals. And that's some of the things that we've done with the with the succession planning. This spreadsheet kind of shows some of the technical skill assessments that we did. Out of the number of people that were shown on that previous slide, several of them have the 35 years. And we, with the skill assessment, the technical skill assessment, we also noticed that these individuals carried a heavy portion of knowledge for all these major platforms, the 10 plus platforms, OEM platforms that I spoke of earlier, the knowledge for those applications were resided in the, just a few, few individuals. So we knew that wasn't healthy. As you can see, it's um, kind of uh, concentrated by employee one, employee four, employee C, six. So we want, what, our goal is to kind of spread those skills and knowledge in the future across the ENI community and across the team and not let it just be in, you know, reside, I'll focus on just one or two employees. Next slide. And this kind of shows some of the PLC. I wanted to highlight the employee number two. Just on the PLC applications, this one employee had all the skills. 
all the skills for all the different platforms. And um, again, we wanted to, the goal is to kind of identify, we've identified this is a critical skill, so now we're coming up with ways to redistribute and build that, you know, fill that skill gap across the NI community and eliminate that skill gap. Our next focus was the training matrix. I did a training matrix um, to identify uh, all of the ENI community and other support roles that was needed in order to um, be trained to fill these skill gaps. So we took the same list of technology that we had identified and now we're building a training program to distribute these um, these skills on a more mill-wide basis. And as you can see here with the X's, we have a better uh, distribution of skills and it positions the company in a, you know, for upset conditions where we're able to respond better and get the mill back up quickly. So in training the workforce, one of the things that we're doing um, we're sending all of our technical staff to specific OEM training, uh, hardware training, software training, programming, system administration, as well as maintenance and troubleshooting. And we're, as we're doing that, we're identifying ma our major key players that are being sent off for that type training. But what, how, what we're doing in-house in to kind of spread the knowledge abroad, we are building our own technical training library and uh, that's through videos, small, short how-to videos like Ram was speaking of earlier that he demonstrated, and also how-to do documentation so that we'll have quick references for all of our ENI community for any technical re uh, resource. They can easily go and access this tr training information to be able to um, get things back up quickly if something, in the case that something happens as well. Next slide. So that's, that kind of summarizes uh, what we've done um, here at, at Flint River Warehouser. And uh, we're continuing to build this, uh, this technical library. We're continuing to work toward building this skill gap. And it's, it's a journey. You know, things constantly change. And um, we really have less than five years to really make it before we see a full turnover in the face of our whole, whole workforce here. So, it, you know, sometimes you can get behind the ball, but we're, we're trying to stay ahead of it and, um, and, and to be able to fill these skills quickly. Any questions? All right, thank you both. Um, like Rachel said, we're going to go ahead and jump into our Q&A session. Um, I've already seen some questions come in, but please go ahead and submit those into the Q&A chat box uh, that's on the right-hand side of your screen, and we're going to go ahead and proceed in that manner. So the first question comes from Pat, and he asks, uh, what are the pros and cons of using contractors versus consultants, uh, contractors slash consultants with specialized enterprise instead of training in-house personnel? Yeah, I'll take that one. Okay. Sure. I'll let you go first, then I'll fill in my answer. Okay. Well, I would think uh, one of the pros that we've seen is that um, we send them off for specific training. Um, you're not just doing a train-to-trainer type thing like you do in in-house. Sometimes things are missed. Um, if you wanted to get more concentrated and more, more uh, focused, on a particular technology, we send them off as an expert to gain all of the, the overview as well as the details um, of programming and configuration or hardware, troubleshooting, whatever it might be. Uh, we, we've seen a great benefit. We let those become the major experts. We send them off for that type of training. And for the in-house, we uh, focus on training the, the masses, I would say. So it's, um, you, that's, that's the purpose of the training libraries. So there, there are pros. I, I see pros on both sides. Um, 
I think you have to do both. In my experience, what we have seen is uh, when you do training in-house, uh, the, the one disadvantage is people still have to keep the place up and running. So there is some distraction of doing in-house versus uh, doing it outside in an off-site location. Uh, the second piece of that is from a from a when you send somebody for an OEM training, uh, they are going to train your employee on their product and not most likely on your application. Uh, the training is not uh, training is is is, is a one-size training that fits everybody. May, there might be an extra week here to learn an extra skill within the same same training product, but it's not going to focus on your application. But if you do it in-house yourself, people that have been running your facility for 25, 30, 35 years have, have been doing it pretty successfully, and they know the ins and outs on, on the application, the process, the product, the platform, so on and so forth. Uh, so once you get a baseline, like Rachel said, there's no point in, in, in starting off in step two by doing internal training, but if you can do a basic introduction 101 training externally, if you don't have those training modules available to you. And then phase two would be then pair, it, pair that person up with an expert to say, okay, now this person knows the basics of what a control valve is, what a PV is, and blah, blah, blah. Now show them how you would control, a, control or run a certain area within your plant or do certain uh, changes in terms of your management of change, uh, what are your procedures, policy. External training is not going to train a new hire on your company's cultural fit and your way of doing things, good, bad, or indifferent. If that place has been running 30, 40 years successfully, the people that have been running it are obviously doing something right. And also, one other comment on that. Uh, with internal training, uh, with the technology, the, I guess the broad um, base of technology that we have here, uh, some of it is obsolete, but you still have to maintain it. You have to still keep the plant running. So in-house training really helps in that sense because you really can't send a person off, a new ENI person, off to get training on an obsolete piece of equipment because it's not being provided by the OEM. So again, that's one of the reasons why we're building our technical library on some of the uh, obsolete equipment that's going to be here for a couple more years before we actually up do some upgrades and that, that helps in that case. Okay, uh, our next question comes in from Angela and she asks, uh, what's the ideal ratio between mentor and trainees? Uh, in my experience, uh, we, we try to keep it around six to one, uh, anything more than that. Depending on what your goal for the mentor is outside of uh, providing mentoring, if that person's job is just doing this, then the ratio could be higher. Uh, we try to keep our mix between uh, doing day-to-day -day operations in terms of uh, keeping the place up and running, uh, doing peer review on projects, uh, training new people, helping with functional specs, pretty much working on a project uh, almost uh, on a full-time basis. And you, no matter who you pick, you've got to probably be dedicated to it, uh, focused to it, and a mentor trainee should spend at least an hour a day together. Uh, so if you have or hour in a week, so if you have, if you have five people, mentor does six hours of project work, an hour of other overhead tasks, and an hour mentoring new person. A five to one, six to one ratio seems ideal. At least that's what we've found uh, in my experience. Okay, great. Uh, our next question is how to encourage experienced employees to share their knowledge as a real practical knowledge. Rachel, you want to take that one, and I'll give you give my perspective after that. Yes, um, leading the process control team. One of the things that um, we've done is to really show that they are the experts, and we're giving them, um, providing them the, I guess you would say, the budget. We're kind of providing them what some of the things they have ideas that they're sharing on how they can we can get this knowledge out, so we're engaging them, for one. You want to engage the, the expert and to let them know that this is a platform for them to lead their legacy. And um, the thing is that they're concerned about is, you know, their time being uh, 
just strained. Um, so you have to come up with ways to uh, bring in outside resources to help pull that knowledge out and, and put that information in a, in a format that they can easily give to the mentees so it's not uh, taking more than an hour a week you know, of their time because it could be extensive if you don't have formalized training things in-house in, in place. Um, so we are, the way we're doing it is we're engaging them by um, just letting them give their input uh, in the process and as we establish the process, then the training um, begins. And I think Rom actually showed a mentee-mentor relationship, how the data is um, passed back and forth. Um, that, that really does work when, when you have the mentee taking the notes and updating the documentation, that, that, that also helps. Yeah, what, what I have found in my uh, experience doing this, the very first time we partnered uh, and when we were doing this uh, with, with the client, the senior person came in and pretty much said, so I'm going to train you to, to do my job, and that's the example I used on my slide, and, and my response was, not really. You've been doing this for 30, 40 years. If answering the phone at 2 in the night so you can have a good night's sleep means I'm doing your job, yes. If it means you're going to train more people, and when you assign work to somebody, uh, there are multiple ways. I, the example I use is you put four engineers in a room and give them a problem. They're going to come up with 10 different ways of doing solving the problem. Uh, you're, you're, you're training people to do it the way you have been trained, the time-tested method of you know it will work, and explaining to them why you're doing what you're doing and communicating to them over time and, and then the end goal is uh, we, we like it or not, a 40-hour work week is never a 40-hour work week. All of us work 50, 60 hours on a regular basis in terms of getting, getting things done, especially in the manufacturing industry. Uh, having that buy-in of, of, from a senior person of that work-life balance, you are, you are doing this so you can have a better work-life balance. You, we are asking you to do this because you are bringing more people in and you are the expert, leave your legacy in there. And having that, that, that trust between the manager, the supervisors, the mentors, the experts, and, and the trainees. Um, the first time we did this, it was we have, we have evolved over time. Our processes evolved over time. The first time we did this, we, we learned some lessons. And since then, we've applied those lessons to uh, future endeavors and partnerships with, with our clients to make it seamless. And, and also with that, you know, um, with having a caring relation, caring environment, um, we are, you know, focused on building relationships between the the mentee and the um, mentors, and so them building that relationship, they want to help. The, the experts are wanting to give their time. They see these are new people coming in, and they want to, um, they, so they become more engaged. So it's also about your environment, what type of environment that you're setting in place to, to really engage your, your, your experts. Okay, we'll move on to our next question from William. Yes, in your experience, do you get negative feedback from employees that an increased level of automation will reduce staffing requirements? If so, how do you manage these situations? Uh, yes, well, I definitely I've faced that over the 22 years in controls here. Um, anytime we're automating, that was, you know, the first concern of operations, our operators, you know, are you, you know, doing this so it'll replace my, my job. Um, but we always encourage them by, to, you know, getting them involved, first of all, to see um, how much easier it will uh, make their job and uh, cause them to have to spend less time looking at or doing certain keystrokes on the, on the system, opening and starting something. Uh, if you have more of an automated startup procedure, how it would reduce that time for them. So what, the way we've seen it be successful is that we engage the operators and letting them tell us what, what, what they suggest would make it better, you know, how, how they would like to improve their process. And it's all about improvement versus um, trying to uh, automate something to, to replace 
particular position. So it really starts with um, getting them involved. Okay, our next question comes from Matthew and he asks, uh, what can companies do to recruit uh, operations and E&I techs such as former military or tech schools? Are there any other talent pools you have recruited from? I'll take that one first and I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Uh, we, okay. Like I said in my, in my earlier slides, uh, we have partnered with a tech school here we are partnered with a local uh, engineering college and our talent acquisition group. We are thankful to have a great group here. Uh, they have partnership with multiple uh, universities across the country, and 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 they have and I sit in on 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 the advisory board at our uh, at, at the local places here. It's a straightforward partnership built over time. Uh, we, we tell them what the industry needs in terms of what they have to teach their students and. When they come in to work for Maverick, uh, we know what we are getting. We sponsor lunch and learns with them, and uh, we have a half a day shadow a Maverick employee uh, event that we sponsor, and and it helps in terms of partnering with. Uh, we've also made a conscious effort to hire uh, people from the services. Uh, one of our main uh, talent acquisition leads uh, uh, has is an ex-Navy person, and he has uh, partnerships with that group where we bring in uh, ENI techs to the Navy program. And for, for warehouse or the mill that I'm working at, we have a partnership with uh, one of our local technical schools where we, we you know, recruited several people for the ENI community um, for hiring. Uh, we take, actually sent several over there for training. Uh, for like six weeks uh, uh, training prior to get, even get, being selected. Um, as far as the engineering side, we haven't done as much, but we're doing a lot of internships, you know, so we are recruiting with some of the uh, local college, well, the colleges, we went, we actually go and do active recruiting. And then some of the local high schools, we are, we have internships that we open to students that are interested in pursuing the path of engineering as a career. Okay, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. If you wanna to advance to the next slide, we can wrap things up. Um, if you missed any portion of this webinar or you'd like to watch the recorded version, uh, we did record it and we will be emailing all registrants with a link to this recording along with additional links and supporting information. So be on the lookout uh, for an email from me in the next couple of days with that information. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, um, that once you click out of this webinar, a survey will pop up. Uh, so just take a few minutes to take that survey. It doesn't take very long at all, one or two minutes. Um, and that's about it. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Closing the Skills Gap, How to Cultivate a New Generation of Experts webinar. We hope you acquired useful information and hope to see you again in one of our future webinars.